We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three. Listen. Listen, brother. Listen, rising comic. You got know, Zachary. All he has to do is say, yo, stop, Zachary. Okay, are you, are you Nancy? <laughs> you say, oh, you already know? <laughs> That's the most gangster thing I have heard all day. <laughs> so you work downtown. Is that all you're going to get me or are we going to... Okay, that's a cool. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm still gonna be up here 15 more minutes with staring at you. <laughs> nothing to do. Wait real hard like you're having a seizure, all right? You know what I'm saying, man? You ain't gotta say nothing out loud. Don't hold his arm. Don't hold his arm first, lady. You all right? Beautiful place during the day. Nighttime, gotta lock the doors. He got married and married again. <laughs> Is this how y'all do a homestead? Y'all just take it? Yeah, like, I'm only kidding. You don't have to come up. Just sip some water and just leave it up there for people. <laughs> <laughs> they said, no, no, I'm low English. They said, comedy show. Yes. I said, God can turn your life around. He did it for me. He turned my life around 360 degrees. <laughs> okay, some of y'all need to go back to math class. Y'all like, what's the problem with that? All right. The Maurice Brown Comedy Show coming your way post-pandemic standby. You may see it on the virtual platform. But today on the Maurice Brown Show, we have a special guest that is actually was a, a semi-finalist on the uh, of season eight of America's Got Talent, uh, a great comedian and impressionist. And she is going to grace the Maurice Brown show uh, with us today. Uh, also, she has a show on Amazon Prime, which is called Fake News, a Trump story. I do believe that is the uh, name of the show, <laughs> which you got to check out. Um, and so also uh, she was discovered. Actually, her doing a fake infomercial as a host and invited her onto Inside amy schumer and uh and she's also uh been seen on lucifer uh the emmy award-winning show casual as well as insecure just roll with it and a recurring role on disney's walk the prank ladies and gentlemen please welcome to the show the very funny and the very talented angela hoover angela how Yay! are you and all after the age of 40. Woo! <laughs> Our Wi-Fi is really, yeah, I, I, you got to love it. I, I We missed that part. What did you say? All after the age of what, Angela? I said all after the age of 40, and then I <laughs> screamed. Okay. <laughs> Our awesome stuff. I'll tell you, this, this Wi-Fi is kind of tricky. We were talking before coming on live about what do you do during the pandemic to kind of supplement the inability to perform and be on stage uh, and, you know, going live. And we, you were sharing some inter interesting points about where you are right now in that regard. Yeah, you know, obviously all the clubs, most of them have closed. I mean, I did perform at the comedy store for one of their virtual shows where they had one person come in at a time for a specific show called Social Media Meltdowns, where people read actual Yelp reviews as celebrities yeah. or people. But, um, but that's pretty much to the extent, well, the audience watched at home, but that's pretty much to <laughs> the extent of my live performing since the quarantine. Mostly yeah. I've been doing, I do, you know, a lot of celebrity impressions on my Instagram. And when the quarantine first started, I told everybody I was going to repost a celebrity impression every single day that I had one. And I, I did do that. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to create more. But what was happening was I was working so much writing and editing and filming that I ended up setting up a Patreon page for people that wanted to support and subscribe and, um, and learn how to do the, ha you know, I share hacks on like how to do a celebrity impression. So that's kind of been the bulk of what I've been doing during this quarantine. Yeah, and, but you know, we were also talking about because I was telling you that you know I'm chasing after all these comedy shows, always performing and and loving it, by the way. But yeah. you know when it when it all stopped and came to a dead stop, it was kind of like ah, oh, this totally. is kind of relieving. You know, the pressure was kind of off. Did did you kind of get the same vibe? 
I felt the exact same way. I was all, I, yeah, as I was mentioning to you before we started, you know, I was already kind of feeling this urge to take a pause on stand up and do some other writing and creating, you know, here at the house. And yeah, um, I felt the same way. And one of the things I realized since this quarantine is I'm more of an extroverted introvert, I think, okay. <laughs> because okay. I really don't mind being at home. You know, I'm really kind of comfortable being here. I mean, I love people. I know a lot of Canadians actually aren't huge fans of people. <laughs> a lot of them that I've met, you know, are not like, you know, they, they like going out and then like getting home and they don't want to really socialize a lot. Not all, but a lot. But yeah. I really do. I really do enjoy um, meeting people and talking to people at the shows and stuff. So I miss, I miss that part a lot. But, yeah. um, but I really do like creating in my, in my home, in my home, just inside my home. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it's a different vibe. I have this show going and this was something I always wanted to do, but I, you know, never really stopped long enough to really do it because, you know, I'm chasing the comedy shows and so forth. And now I'm doing it, I'm expanding it. And, and I've got some more ideas that I actually can't wait yeah. to actually implement what I've got something new coming out in November. And uh, I actually could be more beneficial for me to perform on this platform. So when we go back, you know, I'll be able to take this with me, you know, so it's, it's been beneficial. That's great. So you just started this since the quarantine then? Oh, yeah, yeah. What That's I awesome. To, I started doing it at comedy shows, but it came a little, became a little bit too um, involved because I was there to perform. And I'm also doing this with comedians and, and, and it just got in the way of my stand up. Yeah. And I just stopped. Yeah. And just, okay, I'm just here to do stand up. I can't do all these other things. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. And so I, I did start it. I did probably 25 episodes. And then I, like I said, it just got to be a bit convoluted and too much. And I stopped. So now I can just totally focus on this platform and, and, and it's been pretty awesome. So, um, I, I, for me, it's, it's been a pretty good deal. Have you tried or, or do you ever perform stand up on the virtual uh, pr platform or Zoom? No, I have to be really honest. I have been asked to do that and I've declined twice. <laughs> well, yeah. well, once was because I was in the middle of doing um, a 48 hour film challenge. That was the first yeah. time. And then the second time, you know, I just felt like, you know, I think I need to recalibrate some of my material and the way that I would deliver it and things like that. I just didn't want to perform what I was performing before without having like, I don't know, 30% fresh new perspective to add. Yeah. So it is something I want to do, but I, ha I haven't done a virtual stand up show yet, but I, I, I would like to watch a few. Um, I'm supposed to watch one. I'm like what's today? What's the date? Twenty second. Today's okay. the twenty second. Yeah. Yeah. So it's either tonight or tomorrow. I'm going to watch one. I think it's Flappers, but um, really want to see how how it goes. I mean, I did think of doing a stand up special by myself for my teens who would okay. laugh at literally nothing, and <laughs> I thought that would be really entertaining for parents to have yeah. their reaction of them like. To everything I say. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, thinking yeah. of something like that, or maybe performing to my mom. You know, just something like I think that's funny. Well, you know, it's really I I did uh, uh what do you call it? I did a streaming stand up as soon as the pandemic hit. All the shows closed down, but it was one of those deals where you do a pre recorded set, you send it in, and then oh. on a designated night they run it in. You know, they run all the routines, and I'll never do that again. That was hard. Yeah, that was hard. I could have done that in the mirror or something. That was practical. <laughs> right. You know, and so then around uh, June, I had some friends in comedy that kept urging me, hey, Maurice, you, you got to try comedy on Zoom because you can actually see faces on the laptop and yeah. have interaction. Actual humans. And uh, I kind of, you know, really drugged my feet on that for a while because, you know, the, the laughs are delayed and I just, it, I don't know. So anyway, I finally did it and, and it's not bad. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's not like the real deal, but it's, it's a, it's not bad. I mean, and so I've been right. doing that. 
uh, from time to time, I'll do a gig and of course doing this on the platform, but no, I think you should try it, Angela. I really, okay. I'm going to try like it. it. I'm yeah. going to try it. You, you'll, you'll really like it because you can see the faces and you can see their reactions and you can hear them. Sometimes an audience uh, member will mute <laughs> their mic. I don't know why they do that. Uh, but sometimes they'll do that or, or they'll be eating noodles or something and not realize they're, and that's always entertaining, of course. But, <laughs> or they take the phone with them to the back. You're like, you don't need to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, it's fun. I, I highly recommend that you give it a shot. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience though. And by the way, you come on recommendation uh, by Carrie Pomerale. I had, right. I had Carrie on the show. And she said, Maurice, you've got to have Angela Hoover on. And of course, I did my research and, and I, I saw the stuff you've been doing, which is which is very impressive. And you're really, really good <laughs> as an oh, impressionist. So I thank immediately uh, tried to seek you out. And, and here you are. So, yeah, Carrie, Carrie really thinks a lot of you. And I see why in doing my research. But tell us a little bit about your experience on America's Got Talent season eight. Okay. Well, that was back when people rode in carriages with horses. And yeah. um, no, season eight. Okay. Yes, that <laughs> was that was that was a great experience. Um, yeah. I I think I was on a plane, and I saw. Well, let me just start by saying, during that time, I think it was 2013. Maybe okay. I saw it in 2012, like on TV. You know, obviously, I'd see I've seen it on TV before. But at that time, <laughs> right. a, a lot of professional comedians, maybe they were, but, you know, our managers, agents were kind of poo-pooing, like, you don't want to go on America's Got Talent. It's kind of like more for amateurs. It was not at all for amateurs. And even yeah. now, you see people that you've seen on The Tonight Show a million oh, times. Oh, the talent is really steep. It's really yeah. steep talent. I mean, now yeah. it's no, incredible. No. But that that's kind of what the, we were hearing is like, you know, you don't want to go on. The, and then I saw somebody I knew on it, and I'm like, I want to go on it. And <laughs> right. so it's so, so funny. So I called my agent. I said, I, I really want to go on America's Got Talent. And um, they're like, okay, great. So we'll find out the details. So they're like, all right, we got you a, a front of the line pass. And I was like, great. So I get there and I walk right up to the table. And then I was like, it said my name. I'm like, okay, great. Just go into that room. And and I was like, and what's this for? She goes, yeah, that you're here now. Like there, there was no line for the front of the line pass. And what yeah. you had to do was go in a room with, I don't know how many thousand people, a gigantic room. And then you wait, I think I was there nine hours. So that, that front of the line pass was not uh, wow. what it was wow. meant to be. No. So, um, so I did, you know, like everyone else, I just, I waited and, um, audition you, you know, you're you're waiting all day to audition for 90 seconds to yeah, yeah. two people and then you're back in the hallway for an hour and then hopefully they come out and say okay now we want to send you to the producer you know other producers and then you walk in a bigger room with like 14 people they're all at the desk like you know yeah and yeah, they're just like yeah, who else yeah and i and i asked a comedian you know do you think i should do celebrity impressions because back then i really wasn't doing a ton of celebrity impressions. I think I was doing three, maybe four, and that wasn't the bulk of my act. And she's okay. like, "Yes, you should do celebrity." Stupid, you know, do celebrity impressions. Yeah. So I did, <laughs> and then they just kept saying, "Well, who else can you do? Who else can you do?" And then I, yeah. I had a bunch of people prepared, and that's kind of how that started. But the whole thing was, on the whole, it was an amazing experience that I'll never forget. The only time it got really tough was towards the end when, you know, they really try to make it <laughs> traumatic, you know, and yeah. they're just like, oh, what did, what do you think when Howie said that to you or when Howard Stern said that to you, do you feel like less confident? And, you know, so then you're, then yeah. it's kind of messing with your head in your hotel room that night. So that yeah. when it becomes a pressure cooker, because I was, I was kicked off the, the person before the final 12. So I think I was number 13. Okay. So I got booted right before those 12 made to the finals. So that was, that was tough. But I mean, I got to perform at Radio City Music Hall twice and I can't believe that happened. So that was, that was amazing. I'm real, I'm glad I did it. I, and I would do it again. And I'd recommend it to comedians, to comedians to audition for sure. 
Well, I went there in 2000. Oh, my gosh. I, I guess I want to say 2014. It must have been 2014 in Philadelphia. Oh. And uh, I, I, you know, what what I noticed, because you don't perform in front of a live audience until no. what round? Until what part? Well, I never performed in front of a live audience until they said you... You know, because obviously, like the Hollywood thing, it's always like there's no guarantee. You know, even though we passed you, it could you could we could call you and say sorry, you got kicked out. You know. Yeah. So basically, once I got past that day and I got through those two rounds, they still didn't say anything. They weren't like you're good. You know, they were like bye. Yeah. You know. And then <laughs> three, two months, three months passed. Then yeah. they send send me a thing saying you're gonna be. Per be performing in front of an audience, but I still didn't know it was the televised one in front of the judges until like yeah. a week before. I was like, oh, oh it's wow. that? So oh, that's my the gosh. first time I performed in front of the live audience was for the celebrity judges on TV uh, at the Pantages in uh, Los Angeles. Okay. How many people were in the audience? Do you remember? A roundabout? Um, I think a little, I think uh, like maybe 2,300 people. Ooh, wow, that's what, I know when you're watching it on TV, um, you it, it it doesn't look like it's really that many. I mean, I, I, from my uh, memory of it, it doesn't look yeah. like it's that many people. But yeah. that's an abrupt, you know, change from okay, it's just you and the judges to that. <laughs> <laughs> Next uh, step whoa. up the ladder, you'll be hanging oh my gosh. by a zip line. Yeah, I yeah. know. Well, well, what the real big jump for me was. The Pantages, once I got out, I mean, yes, I was nervous before I got on stage because I hadn't done stand-up for a while. I was staying home with my kids. I didn't tour. I wasn't a regular stand-up touring or even performing regularly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so from there, once I found out I got through to Radio City Music Hall, they passed me. Okay. Once you step out on that stage, that's where I, I really, if you look at the tape, you, you may not be able to tell, but I... I just know if you ever watch it, like I literally almost have no oxygen. I mean, I'm, I'm behind, you know, stage, just, just, you know, manually breathing. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. where you feel you are swallowed whole because the radio city music hall is, is huge and it's deep and the okay. stage is ginormous. So that's yeah. really what, yeah. where I felt like a speck on the stage. So that, that was jolting. Yes. I can only imagine. And you, you look really great up there, Angela. You were very composed and, and, and everything. I mean, you nailed it. And as a comic, I, I totally identify with the feeling because yeah. you're, you're, you're battling so many different things to stay in that zone. And, um, and, and, and since we're already on the subject, I mean, cause I, I how do you deal with butterflies uh, and nervousness before you go up? I think it's actually a really good sign if you're nervous because it tells you that you know you don't totally have this thing licked, you know? And I think that's always a good <laughs> yeah. thing. And as comedians, we're reminded of that, right? Like whenever yeah. we have a great performance, usually yeah. the next one, you know, or if you have a not great one, oftentimes, you know, maybe the next couple are going to be better. So yes, yes. Um, I just think of it as like humility and that I'm alive and my heart is working and um, <laughs> it's just always going to come, you know, it just, it yeah. just always, I'm never like, <laughs> I got this, you guys. Yeah. Never. Yeah. I'm always yeah. a little bit nervous and um, obviously preparation really, really helps. Yes. You know? Yes. And well, you know, you know I heard, you got to be prepared. I love, I love, uh, I love what you just said. About, that's a great statement. I love it. Um, you, I, I don't have this thing totally lit. Okay. I don't even have <laughs> but, it partially. So, yeah. <laughs> right. But I, you know, I, I can tell you that, you know, I go up 10 seconds before I go up. My mind is like, how am I going to remember all this stuff? And uh, I get up there and I just immediately go into this zone and everything just comes out the way that I pretty much practiced it or wrote it simply yeah. because of the preparation. Like you said, I mean, you practice so much, you practice, you practice, you practice. And then when you when you get up there, I mean, you're just in that zone because yeah. you can do great one night and you can bomb the next night totally. and you're going, man, what what happened? Right. You know, it, it's just part of comedy and what we do but 
you nailed it. I mean, you were on it and and, and everything. And I mean, no question, you you were 100 uh, percent spot on and you met the challenge. I heard an NBA referee say once before a game, he said, if you're not nervous before a big game, you ain't breathing. Right. <laughs> true. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> it's true. So, yeah. You know, it's, it, it's sometimes that, it's funny because yeah. I remember when I was just starting, I would see comedians that um not not a lot, but some that weren't, you know, they're were focusing, but not just focusing, but just weren't very talkative and like this, their energy. And then they get up and they're like, hey everybody, like, and that's to me is um to me would be risky. Like it's, it's one thing to focus. I, I get that. But like, if you're not at all like that normally, but then you switch yeah. it on for the, like, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm kind of the same off stage as I am, I think on stage. Yeah. But if yeah. I had to, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, oh, in, it's interesting. It's 100%. Like, huh, yeah. I know guys, uh, Angela, that are like so focused on performing. It's like, you can't talk to them. Yeah, like they're 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 in this space. You come within three feet of them or three inches, and they're and you know you better stay away. Right, and <laughs> I you know, and it's like if you see someone writing, obviously it's like you got to leave you know leave that person alone because they're doing something. So I get that, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just uh, it's just interesting observation. Everybody's got these different styles. I'm yeah. like you. I, I'm. I don't. I feel like if I don't have it once I get to the venue, I'm never gonna get it. So right. it, it, this is it. I'm here. So yeah. I just talk and chit chat with everybody and and go up there and and just hit the gas. Yeah. You know, I'm here now. It's time to rock and roll. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I just wondered what that was like, because like I said, I was there in Philadelphia and I know the process in 2014. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff, some tons of people there and yeah. there's tons of talent there, by the way. I mean, yeah. the, the, the talent is steep. It's not a, it's not a walk in the park. No. So for you to get as far as you did is, is, is quite amazing. And the fact that you used another skill set of doing impressions, you know, to, to catapult you into that uh, position, because I saw that Howard Stern and Mandel and those guys were totally mesmerized by your impressions. And uh, did you, you formed a kind of a routine with the impressions, I take it? Yeah. Well, you know, it was such good practice anyway, because I tend to be more of a storyteller doing stand up. I'm not like, a, yeah. a, and I admire those people that do the setup punch, setup punch, you know, I mean, I just think they're amazing. But um, that isn't really, it's not really my style. And I'm not also not very skilled. But um, so I would do these long stories. And so with 90 seconds, you don't really have time for that. So it's probably the hardest I've ever worked, obviously on a set. But yeah, I did. I wrapped, well, I think I wrapped three impressions into 90 seconds. And then of course, like me, I always add something in like an idiot at the last minute. And then I, I think I added in Broadway star Kristen Chenoweth, like three days before I was supposed to do the thing. And I sent them the, you know, the rewrite. Yeah. And um, yeah. But then what happened was once I got through, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to learn more celebrity impressions. So then when I went back to LA from New York, I, I wanted to do Sofia Vergara. And it's funny because when I watch now, I'm like, I didn't quite have it. I, now I have it. But it, I mean, it was there a little, but now I feel like it's, it's so much better. When I watch let's, any let's, of my let's, performances let's, there, I'm like, it's, hard, it's still hard for me to watch because I kind of nitpick. But um, yeah. But yeah, Let, so well, then I went to a, oh, I'm sorry, Maurice. I just. No, I, I was gonna to say. Let, let's see a little Sophia. Uh, okay. Just a little so, bit. So Sophia. So what happened was I went to um, the Ha Ha Cafe because I knew there was gonna be a largely like Latina Latino audience, and I knew they would tell me or react uh, accurately if I got it wrong. Yeah. And they were nice about it, but um, okay. So. I, Sophia was like, you know what, Maurice? I'm so happy to be here on your show. It is so great. And then she does this thing where she goes, <laughs> she does this like double chin. She looks a lot prettier when she does it. <laughs> but you know yes. what? If I look so good no matter what I do. If I had the earphones in, if I have the earphones out, it doesn't matter. I can tell dandruff shampoo. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Perfect. And you know what? 
that is what she capitalizes on. It's like she could just she can say anything. It's and it and it's hilarious with yeah. that accent. It's so thick. I know. <laughs> you know, everything she says is is hilarious, and you you have it spot on. But what's <laughs> really funny is, I don't know if you necessarily have to um, <laughs> get a, 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 a how should I put this? It, it, it to the average listener, you know, if you just did a Spanish accent, that would just be good enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like now nah, that you, you you don't have to get anybody to really sign off. Oh, that's it. That's how we do it. Yeah. it it's, it's good enough. It's funny. Right. That's how she sounds. <laughs> so when you were there, you really weren't 100 percent ready to do the impression. I mean, I did not have a treasure trove of impressions ready to go. No, I yeah. didn't. And I didn't even have. Tons of, I mean, I feel like I didn't even have these tons of like quick line jokes. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to write, I have to write new stuff each time I perform. Yeah. Unlike if I was a comedian touring, I would just use my best bits, right? That are already tested and true and maybe spruce them up and put them in that 90 seconds. 90 seconds is a short amount of time to, yeah. You have no oh warm my God. Up. Yeah, and that's another thing that bothered me when I was there. I didn't know what the time. Did they have ninety seconds to then too for you? Yeah, well, I had to start yeah. with ninety seconds. I'm like, how in the world can you do a routine in ninety seconds? And and I I had to condense a lot of stuff into that little uh, area, and it just felt very awkward. Um, it just oh, <laughs> I, you know, I really don't think. Uh, Angela, and I please correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know, and you would certainly probably have the answer because you went so deep into it. But it doesn't seem like it's geared per se for comedians. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think I I didn't realize this when I was on because you know sometimes you your own accolades or accomplishments. I don't know. I think as human beings, we just kind of automatically downplay of like, well, yeah, I got through that. But then afterwards, yeah. I saw a lot of comedians that are way better than me not get through. And then that's what made me think of what you're saying of like, I don't know if it is really geared. I mean, I think and a lot of times what I think is funny or not funny is what the judges are laughing at. And I'm like, like, I thought this other guy was hilarious and you weren't laughing. And now you're laughing at this guy. And I've heard these jokes a million times. So yeah. I don't know. I think I might have a skewed, weird kind of sense of humor. but. um like even the set that Howard Stern didn't like of mine, when I watched it finally, like years later, I'm like, I think that's weird and I like it. I like it better than the other one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think it is difficult just because you just have to get right to the point. And I'll tell you who really helped me with that is Carrie. Yeah. Carrie, the one that- Oh, really? Okay, me. wow. Carrie Pomeroli. You know, I-, I, I did my act for her. I actually did it in the back of her house. I forgot about this. She had some little stage set up because she's Carrie Pomeroli. Yeah. And her mom friends who were very harsh, uh, harsh critics, <laughs> and their kids were sitting there. I don't think any of them knew who I was doing. I don't know. But um, and she she worked on the phone with me and was like, get rid of this word, get rid of that word, like get rid of every single word, like you do in stand-up, right? Like get yeah. rid of every single yeah. word you don't need. And so she helped me really just tighten it. So I have her to thanks. Well, thanks. and, and Carrie, Carrie, Carrie is awesome. She's a really great comic. Uh, and I, I think that was my second year. I mean, I'm, I'm about seven years into comedy, seven or eight dedicatedly. So that was my second year. And I did, I had no idea how to force material into a 90 second window. I just, I just, and I went into the room and everyone was laughing at that this 12 year old kid, he might have been 10, I don't know. He came up there and he sang like an angel, you know. And I kind of looked at everybody else and said, This has been a lot <laughs> of fun. Like, great. Yeah. Yeah. This has been fun, guys. Because there's no way we're going to beat this kid. <laughs> <laughs> and of course they they picked him and he went on and it was it, it was a nice experience but bravo to you uh Angela for your effort that that was uh, pretty darn amazing um and, and speaking of your comedy how long is your like i clearly you do shows how long is your average set 
for a gig? It it just depends what it is, right? Because if you're doing LA clubs around here, they usually ask for anywhere from like 10 to 20 minutes. Yeah. More like 15. A lot, a lot of them is not even 20 minutes. So usually I would say between 10 and 15, if someone hires me, for like a corporate thing or, you know, I have a gig like I did one in Milwaukee last year. I did one in Montana. Um, then that is normally 30 to 45 minutes. Okay. So, and when people say, oh, can you do an hour, an hour more? And I always tell them like, you really don't, I think 45 is such a, I mean, I'll do whatever they want, but I always say, I think like 45 is like the max because it's hard for someone to watch somebody for 45 minutes. You know, yeah, well, it and is. It, it is. When you, even when you think you're at home watching a special, sometimes you pause it and you're like, and the person's funny and you're just like, okay. So that's usually what I sit at, like between 30 and, and 45. And I remember what you were saying, how you were thinking, oh my God, am I going to remember all this? And I, I remember when I had just finally stretched my material out to 45 minutes yeah. and was doing something in um, Milwaukee. And I remember, you know, I was that person where I was like, don't talk to me. You know, um, I had my cue cards. I mean, I literally do the old fashioned, like little index cards. Yeah. And just go yeah. through them. That way I can shuffle them around as I like. Right. And um, I was really holding on because I was thinking, okay, here I am. You know, I'm headlining and they're paying me and I better get this right. So, well, I got to so take back what I said about the other comedians. I, I, <laughs> I, I took a 45 minute set uh, gig and I had never gone that long before, but I just took it. I said, I'll figure it out. And I, I had my wife sit in the front and as incognito as possible, she had all these cards. So from joke to joke, she would switch them out so I could stay. <laughs> right. We had it all worked out. And uh, you know what, Angela? I never looked at her. I I didn't need it. Right? I, I had it. That's great. Well, sometimes even if you don't have it, which is great that you did, but sometimes yeah. even when you don't have it, it's almost like when you're auditioning for something and they say the cue card's right there and you can't get yourself to look at the cue card for some reason, you know? Yeah. Like you're, you're so involved with the audience, you're like, you're afraid that if you stop, you're going to be, you're going to just get off your flow. And, uh, but that'd be hilarious if she was like, 11. <laughs> hey, listen, I, I tell you, I was depending Sorry, on those cards. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I was depending on those cards when I walked on the stage. Right. And I, like you said, I, once I got into it, you know, I was just off and running. It's just, I just had every, I never had to look at, at, at the cards one time. It was amazing. That's great. But it, it's just come from practicing and practicing and practicing. And and I always amaze myself because I, it's just like, man, that stuff really pays off. Uh, you know, just going over your stuff absolutely. as many times as you can. Yes, just pays absolutely. Off. Um, how much do, does your set, and I, you just kind of answered the question, uh, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because you said that when you were on AGT, you only had three impressions. So I was just going to ask you, I mean, how much, well, now do impressions, uh, how much are they involved in your, your comedy routines? Um, you know, I would say I probably do because I, 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 it's funny because I started doing Kim Kardashian and Kourtney Kardashian and uh, so maybe, maybe 25% or something. And then the rest okay. is just me talking about, you know, my kids and my life and my husband and that kind of thing. So it's definitely not the whole thing, but, but you know, and it's funny cause this is when I asked my friend Vanessa, who's a comedian, Vanessa Graddick, I asked her before I went on AGT if I should do impressions and she's like, yes, you should. And I thought to myself, God, who cares about impressions? Like, is that hacky? And then I, I realized like that people actually love them, <laughs> but I didn't really realize how much I love them till I started putting them on Instagram. And then people were like, Oh, I'm coming here every day. It's like Christmas. Keep doing these, you know? So, yeah. so I still keep them there because people really like them. But, um, I also try to just talk about, you know, my real life. Well, you know, Angela, I think impressions are somewhat, uh, let's see, it's a lost art. 
because you can go back all the way to the, the you're, you're younger than I am, but you may remember Rich Little yes. from the uh, Carson. He's always on Johnny Carson in the 70s. He Matter of fact, as I think about all the impressions, there was Frank Gorman who played the Riddler on the original Batman mm. series, that, that yep. nerdy, dorky Batman show that came on TV. Uh, he, he, he was a very good impressionist. Um, and then I, we've had, um, oh my gosh, there's, there, there, there've been, there've been people here and there. Um, what's the kid's name that was on Saturday night live? The black kid. I can't think of his name. Is it finesse? Finesse or the other one? Um, there's he's finesse. really good. Oh my gosh. He's awesome at it. He's really okay. awesome at it. He does Kevin Hart and it, the Barack Obama. He does all kinds of, he was on, is it Noah? I forget his name. Anyway, he's really good. But you don't see a lot of that. You know, you really don't. And when you do, people get really excited. Howie Mandel said, you're the best working impressionist. I didn't know that was today. so funny. <laughs> you know? and, and honestly, really think about it, Angela. It's a lost art. There's really not a lot of people that can do that very well. Well, you know, I think that, um, I mean, I think I definitely were, were was born with an ear, but I also think from moving all the time um, as a child, I, I was always very interested in people. Yeah. And always fascinated by the way someone does something and the way they walk and how they dress and yeah. what they're eating for breakfast. I mean, I was always fascinated because I always felt like I was so boring and that someone else was so interesting, um, just the yeah. way they do things. So I think I really watched people and studied them really early on. Like I always say, I was like a three-year-old stalker. I was just like, huh, okay. <laughs> and then I would just kind of take it in and, you know, imitate them. And 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 I, I think I, I like what Mandel said because it's, it's just, it's a lost art really. It's just, it's no one really out there doing it. Now, when I mentioned Rich Little and Frank Gorman, there were still a bunch of other people during that time that were doing impressions and they were doing them pretty well. These the seventies had a lot of, a lot of uh, comics that did it. It was something that was really done quite often and yeah. somewhere in the mid eighties, it just died off. It's right. like you just didn't see it anymore. Right. Um, and like I said, other than the kid on Saturday night live, who's a stand up comic, uh, you know, you are are probably the only one that's that's really doing it. And and, well, I, 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 and I all the think girls it, on SNL, like Chloe Feynman's unbelievable at doing impressions, and um, Melissa Via Senor. Um, yeah. And yeah, and then there's you know Gordy Brown. He does impressions in Vegas. He's amazing at it too. He does the singing, you know, singing and the mostly singing impressions. But yeah, but thank yeah, you. Uh, very nice of you. You know, Jim Carrey actually started doing that. Yeah. But the problem for Jim, and of course, as I say, problem for Jim, he's a he's a zillionaire superstar. But the yeah. the, <laughs> the, issue, the issue that Jim was having was that you know that was all he was doing, right? And it was okay, but it was something that wasn't killing. And he and he figured out that he had to kind of veer away from that and start working more on substantive uh routines and and so forth and and he ob obviously did the uh in living color in living which color. really catapulted him and honestly i think now your success on america's got talent has just put you in another stratosphere which is really awesome i don't know what stratosphere that is maurice but thank you i think it's well, a hey, stratosphere listen, on I the carpet no <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, you're 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 in some pretty good stuff. I mean, you're you're in some pretty, you know, visible programs. You know, in, Insecure, Lucifer, and just roll with it. And you got your own show. Tell us a little bit about your show, Fake News, a Trump Story. Well, here's what I wanted to say. It's not my show, and it isn't actually a TV show. It was a film, and um, there's another impressionist who found out. We found out about each other on social media, and his name is John D. Domenico. He okay. does. He does Trump. He is a celebrity impressionist. So okay. he is not a Trump person and nor am I. Anywho, um, so <laughs> <Right. laughs> let's make that clear. So anyway, um, he was going to do this film called Fake News, A Trump Story about okay. whether Trump was fit for office. And they were going to make it a comedy. And they needed somebody to play Melania and Ivanka and Kellyanne Conway and Sarah Huckabee 
and a doctor. And okay. I got to play all those parts in it. So I got to play five parts, which was like a dream for me, you know, to do all yeah. these parts in one movie. A lot of fun. Yeah. It was. Yeah. So we were actually, we were given, that was almost like doing a soap opera because we were given new lines like almost every day and whole backstory to that film. But, um, but uh, it was, it was, it was fun. I mean, obviously Sarah Huckabee was a whole, so fun to do. I mean, I think they asked me if I could do her a few days before we were filming. And I said, <laughs> I'll figure it out. And, um, and we did. <laughs> And so that's that's what that was. Now, now, as a stand up comic, do you obviously you're not really doing a lot of comedy right now during this pandemic. Were you doing a lot of open mics, though, before? Um, I wasn't doing open mics. I haven't done open mics in a, in a while, but I was doing. Um, yeah, I was doing stand up, you know, like, let's see. Was it like Ice House? No. Oh, where was I? Where was I doing? Stand -up? The Comedy Union, obviously, and Flappers, mostly in Burbank. Yeah. Um, but the comedy union, mostly it's kind of like my home stand up comedy place. Now, did you encounter any hecklers at any of these shows? You know, I have to say I have not had hecklers in a while, but I also okay. want to add a caveat to that. And that is I haven't, you know, I think if I were touring in different cities with yeah. different demographics and different kinds of people, I absolutely would be subject to heckling, you know, but because I, I think I'm kind of sheltered in these LA clubs, I haven't, but I, I know, you know, when I was first doing stand up, I think I had been doing it three months and I okay. was at the comedy union and mm -hmm. I had a really great set and I yeah. was doing a bit, I don't know. I, um, I had a bit that went viral and then got taken down because I had some Kanye music at the end playing live when I was doing the stand-up bit. And it was about making fun of um, white people in uh, like black dance clubs. It was like making fun of what white people do. And <laughs> yeah. it, like I, I did it at a, a, a church, like an all black church. Yeah. And I did that. And I also did the difference between white and black churches. Yeah. So it went, so I put up a little clip on YouTube and then it just like took off and then it got taken down. Well, anyway, this the owner of a certain club saw me do that bit and he said, "Come to um, the club. I think it'd be great for the Tonight Show to see you." Blah blah blah. So I went yeah. to the club. <laughs> now this is the part when you, you you know you you haven't licked it yet, but you're just so new to it that you don't really know what you're doing. So you say yes to everything, and Let maybe me. I should have said I'm not ready, but I didn't. So I thought I'd be fine. So I went to this club. Now the club he saw me in was. An urban club, like basically, I would say that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, yeah, ninety percent black audience, and that was the audiences I was used to performing, and that was the audience I was most comfortable performing in front of. Yeah. Now I'm performing in front of an all white audience, and I am okay. like literally scared out of my mind because I'm okay. like, I, I don't know if they're going to understand what I'm saying. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. You know, That's I just, I, I, so I already was kind of screwed. And the people behind stage, you know, they were established TV communities are like, don't mm -hmm. make this showcase mean anything. You're going to do a million of these, you know, just don't put any weight on it. Of course, <laughs> because it's in my hometown, I invited everybody I knew. Yeah. I never, I entered through the back, so I never even saw the audience. That's one thing if you're starting in stand up, like make sure you get there early, make sure you see what the setup looks like, make sure you know get, get where the split in the, the curtain is. Like some of these you're like, hello, like how do I even get out of here? <laughs> right? I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It's like, I'm always like, where's the split in the curtain? Like, is there tape? Because it's happened a few times where I'm literally like, look like I'm under a comforter trying to get out. So <laughs> I come out. And when I say to you, I bombed, I mean, I bombed. Like, I, I, I just, and, it, and of course it was everybody I knew in the audience. Oh my God. And oh my goodness. It was, and no, 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 Maurice, the white people did not get it. They didn't get it. And I knew they wouldn't. No. And, but beyond that, I think I was on top of that was not good. I think my set, I think I second guessed myself. And then, you know, when you're not, you don't get that first laugh and you're not on that wave, then you're yeah. just kind of screwed the rest of the time and you're trying to get back on. You're trying, you're trying it, hard. And it just, it was horrible. And that was, um, it was a fabulous night. No, um, I <laughs> went home yeah. and got into fetal position, but it's fine. <laughs> 
And that's, yeah, so that, that is the one time. It's not the one time. It's not like, I, I believe me, I've done really terrible up on the stage many oh, times. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. But that was like, that was, I bombed. And, yeah. um, and the fact that he had me come to do a showcase for the Tonight Show. Yeah. And it just didn't go well. So. Now, yeah. I think that's really funny and ex it just, just very interesting because the punchline is really on the white demographic. And and <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh, that, no. that, that's where the punchline is, right? Right. And and so because I think I've seen you do that set. I've seen it on uh, YouTube. Yeah. And so it's really funny only to an African American audience because they're not the punchline. And I love it. You see, but what I find interesting about that is Oh my gosh, that's really, really interesting. Because I did a set about blackface once in Virginia at an all black and Hispanic club, and they loved it. I killed. I said, "Oh man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this tomorrow night when I head over to the wharf in D.C. Total Republican side of town. Oh, perfect. Twenty-five to thirty-five year old young Republican aides and so forth. They're gonna love me. I'm thinking." And so uh, I get over there and I'm telling these, I don't even know what I was thinking. I, because I know how to navigate with the, di the different demographics, how to kind of fashion my, my sets. Yeah. And, but I was so excited about this one. I, I just, ah, oh, they'll get it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll love it. And I bombed. I mean, I, I, I mean, I bombed so badly. There was one kid that was in the audience who thought it was really funny. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about yeah, people when you're that bombing. one person, you're like, yeah, thank it, you. But they won't yeah. let it out. They don't want everybody else to know that they think it's funny. Yeah. They don't want everybody else to know that it's wildly funny to them. And so they don't want to let that laugh go, right? And But I saw him just having a rip. I mean, he, he just loved it. That kid, I, and, and I thought it was quite interesting because everybody else, they were just looking at me like they wanted to kill me. But, you know, I, I, it's, 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 you just have to learn how to fashion your sets as far as demographics go because yep, you do. They don't, it's, it's, it's just a tricky thing and yeah. you have to learn, you have to learn the hard way. <laughs> and so it was the, actually, just, I just make jokes about it. It was funny. Well, I think actually. sometimes like for yours, I think it's a different situation. I don't know what the joke was, but for mine, I feel like maybe there was a little bit of like tone deafness or blindness in the white community. Wow. What a yeah. concept, but, um, <laughs> that, right. that, uh, <laughs> that they, like, I feel like, don't you guys see that we do this? Like, don't, you don't see that this happens like what that white people do this, you know? So, I mean, the joke is, is on the white person always. I mean, the joke is always going to be on me, right? If I'm doing stand up, I'm going to be right. putting myself or my own, race down right but right i felt like it was such an obvious thing that white people do this and some and not the not if, if it's a mixed audience people it's all are good totally on board it's all but good if it's all white it's almost like they're like like if you imitate a white person trying to be like do whatever like if and they're and it's a mixed people everybody laughs and they're like we do that that's what we do you know let's yeah. just own it but if it's all white they're like i don't um what do you mean? You know, <laughs> so, exactly. exactly. So I just know that I just, I just learned that really early on. Um, you know, like you do, you just learn what, what's good for one, one section or one demographic isn't necessarily going to hit with another. And it does, it's not even that it's really, cause those, what I was talking about wasn't really offensive. It was just more kind of silly. Like this is such a silly thing white people do, but, um, but, and, and to me to not, recognize it or or go oh yeah i agree with that to not um see that you've seen some another white person do that is like crazy to me no not that even that you have to think it's funny because i yeah. don't think everything's funny. you know what i mean yeah. but anyway yeah well, so that was no, a good learning lesson the, inter <laughs> the interesting thing about it is was about the tone deafness of governor ralph north of, of virginia and i was making fun of the fact that 
as he tried to explain away his error, yeah. <laughs> that he said that, you know, he would just sit here around the frat house with all of his buddies and they thought it would be a rip if he went over to the party dressed as the lead singer of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. <laughs> And, you know, and, and, and the guys I'm over like, this other, at this other club, I mean, they just loved it. They, they, you know, they they just, they were dying over there. And I just said, wow, I mean, this is so obviously funny. I mean, why would anyone get mad at the reality of it? I mean, the guy, okay, look, yeah. dude, you got caught. You were right. going around, you got high and, and you, you got a little crazy and you you were 19. I mean, okay, just get over it, man. It's, it's funny. Just laugh at yourself and. We can all forgive you and move on, you know, but I, I was just, <laughs> and then we'll also made it fun of the attorney generals. <laughs> oh, they hated me, Angela. They, they hated my God. And that's like fear, like afraid to laugh because, you know. Yeah. You know. yeah. yeah. But I, I, I love the fact that, and I, that kind of, so you answered two questions in one with the heckling and the bombing. Well, you didn't. You didn't uh, <laughs> go into the heckling part of it, though. What was the heckling that was going oh, on there? You know, I have to say, I don't know if I... Oh, you know, actually, I know this sounds crazy. I'm trying to think. Heckling? Um, well, there's two kinds of heckling, right? There's one that's like the person is purposely trying to be a jerk and throw you off your game. There's that heckling. Right. Then there's the person that is had too much to drink heckling. And yeah. I'm sorry, there's three kinds. And then there's the third kind, which is <laughs> they're just completely not a conscious, aware, considerate person. And they right. are just talking and they want to be part of your act. And they're like, tell us about when you got married. Like, ugh. Just, so it, yeah. That happened to me in Milwaukee. There was, and, and they said like the later night show, obviously you're going to get more hecklers. They've been drinking longer, blah, blah, blah. And there was a woman that just was talking and like, Love it. Love it. Like, oh my God, you're like killing me. Like the whole, like not the whole time, but in sections. Yeah. yeah. Now, she, in my experience, like I'm not somebody that's like going to go after someone with a vengeance because I, I, I think I, I just leave that to the professionals, but I, I, I think I addressed it and then I moved on because you can spend quite a bit of time trying to to rein somebody in that is not rainable, <laughs> you know, exactly. they've been drinking exactly. and it's a waste. And then you're just kind of taking away from your set and the people that paid to watch you. So, yeah, it's tricky when you're doing a late night show and people are drinking and it's just like, oh, my God, you just want to like shut up, you know. But yes. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I think that's the only time I was like heckled in that sense, but I've never been heckled like you're a piece of crap. You know, I haven't had that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those kind of people, because there are comedians that are dedicated to frying hecklers, they live to do it. Yeah. Right. They want, they want to be heckled so they can destroy someone. Right. Those, those kind of hecklers after running into that kind of comic will never go to another comedy show. I, I can guarantee you they'll never go. No, they will never go again. And 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 honestly, I guess there's a place for 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 that where you know, there are comics who are just time enough for those kind of people. Because I don't do it either. I'm very nice yeah. and I try to talk people down because usually they're so excited they think yeah. they're helping you. Yeah. They're just excited. And or there's a group of them that have been day drinking and they, they, they're they having a block party while you're on stage. That's happened once too. But well, that was yeah. really the club, you know, that happened one time and the club apologized because they didn't have their manager there that night and that would have been shut down and they didn't realize yeah. that it was so loud. So you're kind of talking <laughs> over, it's like you're talking at a concert, you know, it's just yeah. crazy. But yeah, those are the kind of things I've I've had to deal with. Now, Angela, I know that you are a clean comic, as is Carrie Pomerale. Why do you do clean comedy? Well, I gotta be honest. I don't. I don't know that I intentionally do clean comedy because I, I'm probably less clean in my daily life. I mean, in the car anyway, uh, than I am <laughs> okay. on stage. But I just try to be myself and unless something really calls for it. I'm not against people that have profanity in their act at all. Yeah. Um, I just, it just doesn't, 
I don't know. I my set just doesn't really call for it. You'd, okay. you'd say, and if yeah. it did, I would say so. I would, you know, I mean, it's not like I've never said I've never cussed on stage or anything, but I am mainly clean just because it's just it's just who I am on stage. It's just I don't yeah. feel like I need it for most of my jokes. If there was yeah. a joke that I needed, um, then I wouldn't have a problem using it. But I just I also don't want it to be. Sometimes I feel like if you're just leaning on profanity, especially with a lot of comedians that are just starting, they they lean on it a lot. It, it, yeah, it gets they do. tiresome. It gets, to me, Extremely. that's my opinion. It's just exhausting. Extremely. It's like, I just want to hear about your, I want to hear about your take and your point of view. I don't right. want it to be weighed down by that. It's like someone that's, either, maybe you're here, you hear on the radio and they say like, or to be honest, or at the end of the day, six times, it's like, so I think it's just the repetitiveness of it as well can dilute what you're saying. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I, but I, it's funny cause I didn't really even realize I was a clean com comedian. I think Carrie was like, well, since you're a clean comedian, this is like years ago. I'm like, Oh yeah, I guess I am a clean, <laughs> mostly <laughs> clean comedian. Yeah. Yeah. 90% clean. I would say. Yeah. Well, I try to tell a lot of young comics in DC because you're exactly right to your point about, leaning on profanity you get a quick laugh a cheap laugh you didn't you know you, you you didn't earn that laugh you just leaned on something you knew would get a response but where's the the writing where's the substantive thought that goes into writing a good joke and a lot of young comics think that you know they can immediately be you know louis ck well, i don't know i don't think anybody wants to be louis ck right now but uh, you, you know what i mean yeah I, it's like they think that they'll, they're Bill Burr or, or whoever. And it's like, hey, guys, let me just say this to you. Bill Burr and Louis C.K. and Ricky Gervais and whoever it is that's really at the top there, Kevin Hart. I can go on and on. They can go on to Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Seth yep. Meyers, Conan O'Brien, Stephen Colbert and do a clean set just like that. Right. I, I, I mean, it's not a problem. Yeah. And I said, if you guys think that you're going to be on platforms like that doing this, I'm sorry, this is not going to happen. Yeah. You've got to develop the ability to do. If you don't want to do clean comedy, hey, that's fine. I'm not telling you that's what you got to do. I'm telling you, you got to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you just, I mean, even Richard Pryor could do a clean set at the drop of that. It was no problem. Yeah, yeah. And that that means you're a pro. I think so, too. It's also like you're discovering when you're first doing comedy what your filler words are that you lean on and right. we all have them. I think, in, you know, mine is, you know, I'd say, you know, a lot on stage and I'd watch it back and I go, Oh, why did I say that? Just stop talking. Just pause. Yeah. Don't yeah. be afraid of pausing. Don't be afraid of silence. And so sometimes That's a good point. I like those that. profanity words are really just filler, filler words for some comedians. And it's just easy to throw, you know, not even throw them in. They just come out automatically when people are talking. So that's yeah. why I say for comedians or if they want to start doing uh, speaking or stand up is to practice speaking just to your, even to your computer and see how you're constructing your sentences and see, see what you're filling it in with. Is it like, is it, you know, is it um every five? I remember when I took Toastmasters which is yeah. speaking in front of, you know, for people, I'm sure most people know, but it's professional speaking and it's just a bunch of people that work at an aerospace company. Uh, <laughs> you come in and you yeah. practice speaking. And <laughs> there's a person that counts how many likes and ums you say. And I remember the first time I got up to speak about it, they give you a topic, you stand up, you speak about it for a minute or two minutes. And they counted, I remember this, they counted 13 ums that I said. And from then on, I was like, okay, <laughs> duly noted. So I like what you just said there about not being afraid of silence because my, uh, my, my go to word is it's just crazy. It's just crazy. You right. know, it's just crazy. <laughs> and, and, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to remember my next joke. It's That's just right. crazy. That's man, right. I'm telling you, it's, it's, oh my gosh, man. You know, all this kind of meaningless rambling. I'm, it's buying time yeah. because I'm trying to remember my joke, especially if you tell a joke and it doesn't land. Right. And that throws you completely off game. Like you're rolling, oh man, hit him, hit him. And then the next one just boom, right off the table. Right. 
and it messes with your mind. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh man, oh, okay, this is what you're thinking. You're like, yeah. oh, whoa, okay, how do we get back on this horse? So, you know, it's just crazy, man. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Ah. On that? Oh, I know who the comedian is. Yeah. And he's a writer on Conan. Yeah. Dion Cole does a oh, Dion Cole, yeah. funny bit on that. He said, okay. he, yeah, he does a whole stand up about. You know, as comedians, it's so hard. We want you to laugh, and but sometimes we don't know. You know, we get sad if you don't laugh, and so we fill it in. And I think he does that exact thing. He's like, "Ah, it's crazy," and then he does a callback to it later. It's it's very funny. But yeah, oh, it's, it's yeah. a bridge, right? But sometimes it's funny just to just to say what happened. Like, all right, I'll work on that one. Um, you know, and that sometimes gets a laugh. Now, but for you you said your 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 lean uh, phrase is you know, right? Uh, I think you said that. I think it's you know and it's right. I think I do that too. <laughs> so annoying. But you know what? I don't know about you. The only time you're doing that is when your joke falls off the table. Well, sometimes uh, I am sometimes. saying like, we do we do this right. Like, but I don't. I'm saying it to convey something, uh, not just to convey it to really drive the point home. But yeah. it's just unnecessary to say it, really. Because if I'm saying, does this happen? I don't need to say, right? Oh, so annoying. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, that's a good point. You're right. And you could be going, sometimes you do it, you're going really well. Right. Sometimes you you could be going really, really well, and then you start getting too excited. You know, right. it's like, oh, man, this is awesome. Right. I'll kill it. And then you start losing your train of thought on 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 those times as well, you know, it's like, okay, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. You know, and so <laughs> I'm trying to remember what's my next joke. <laughs> That's the yeah. whole kind of thing. And one more thing, because you, you said it when you were talking about that bomb experience, when you're doing black and white churches, it's like when, when you're like, when, when, when the nose is down, I mean, plane's going down, you're getting it. You, you're coming in for a crash landing. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out how to get that stick, get that nose up. I got to get the nose up. I'm, I'm heading for a crash, and I mean, you're doing everything you can to get the nose <laughs> to come back up to avoid the crash landing. And you're, you know, so and then it becomes one of those deals where, and and I'm telling you, Angela, I I have had the ability to get out of those crash landings, but sometimes I don't care what you do. Yeah. You, you're going to crash. Yeah. You're going to crash and you are going to burn. Sometimes it's self-induced. I did one. <laughs> I did a show at a, a uh, an open, uh, what do you call those uh, events? It's, it wasn't church, but they call it a spoken word event. So it was in a mm -hmm. hotel mm -hmm. and they were, they had poetry and song and some, you know, light preaching and they had comedy and there were three comedians there and I was the third comic. So I'm in the headlining position. So when I get out, I'm telling this joke, I, I'm telling these preacher jokes and they're just loving it. I mean, the flash bulbs are going off. A cacophony of flash bulbs are just clicking. I'm going, oh, wow. And I had this one joke that I wanted to tell that I thought was a little dicey. My oldest son told me before the show, dad, don't tell that joke. So I said, hmm, well, it kills in the club. I said, if I tell the joke and they don't like it, They'll forgive me. I got them in the palm of my hand. This is what I'm thinking. And I pull the trigger. <laughs> it was over. <laughs> they turned me off. I was done. And it was a black church, too. It's nothing like bombing at a black church. It's nothing like bombing in front of a black crowd. There's nothing like that, especially yeah. when you're all the way up here. Right. And then you go all the way down. I mean, I lost it in one fell swoop. And I said, oh, man. And I, I did everything I could possibly think of to get the nose back. Oh, man, it was nothing doing. <laughs> it was bad. That's, and it's so funny that your son told you not to. So then, of course, you have that on you when you leave. You're like, darn it. Well, the thing about it is, Angela, we can't help it as comedians. We just love to push the envelope. We love to push boundaries. 
But also uh, I think you go into survival mode, right? You're just like pulling, you're just like, you're going down, like you said, and you're just trying to, well, that time you weren't, you're doing great, but yeah, that was when you're going down, you just pull things. You don't even know where it's from just to survive, you know? Oh, well, that was a, 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 a that was a, a manufactured from wanting to be the best ever. Cause I was already killing. I said, if this joke hits, I'll be the king. That's what I was saying. If I led this one, I'm the king of the hill. They'll have me back every time they have an event. That's what I was thinking. So if you and were I, to I, go back and read the audience and, and put your ego totally aside, would you still think that joke would seem like it would work for that audience? For that, well, now I know that it would not. I mean, I had to, I, I, I just didn't know. I was kind right. of- Right, you didn't know. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. okay. And and yeah. I just I I there was some apprehension. I clearly uh, I was like, oh wow, should I should I? And then when I got on stage, I just kind of said, ah, I don't I, I don't. Why know. don't you think it worked? Was it like too risque for the crowd, or it 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 was too risque for the crowd? It was. I, I'm a clean comic, so what I did was uh, the <laughs> the joke involved the N word. So what mm. I did was I said it descriptively and instead of recklessly, which I also thought I would get a pass on because it was just a descriptive use. I was talking about how the NFL had made that word a penalty on the football field. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was kind of asinine because these young African-Americans today, that they, they it's a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, you know, you get the, the, the these middle-aged white referees are like looking at the N word like a tennis ball, you know. <laughs> They, you know, they don't know what to do with it. It's like <laughs> they, they don't know, have any idea how to handle the word. <laughs> so they made it a penalty, you know, because they couldn't grasp an understanding of it. And uh, I said, you know, the I said um, the punchline of the joke was, you know, can you imagine being at home watching the game and uh, the referee comes up? We have a an infraction on number 21 for calling another player, dude, 15 yards, first down, Confederate flag. <laughs> just throw that out. So anyway, that that and then joke, people just went like, <laughs> oh well, it, it, they oh they hated it. They hated it, and I don't know what it is. It, it always kills in clubs. Everybody laughs at that joke in clubs, but in that environment, it just died. It, it, it I never had are, a chance. Are, are, I think too because you know, like there is a. Um, what is it like a pre-constructed what you do and don't do in a church setting versus a right. comedy club. And right. so they have those pre-constructs around them. So they're not really free to kind of like laugh and be, you know what I mean? It, 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 yeah. And listen to what they might think is funny. They're kind of right. looking around to what, and so they kind of, you know. Yeah. Oh, they just put the blinders on because and then I, I actually <laughs> I developed another joke from the experience based on what you just said. <laughs> You're and, like, and I'm going back tonight to try it yeah, out. Oh. Yeah, no, I I tell that joke and and urban rooms, you know, pretty much the same way I I just told you more or less. You know, with where after it works, then I'll go back and say I told that same after everybody's laughing. And right. I said, well, I told that joke <laughs> at a church once and they hated me for it. And then uh, I said, well, they probably were out of the parking lot, you know, saying, do you believe that in said in? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and they love that. So, I, right. but I, what I learned was, okay, all risque jokes, anything that I think is dicey will never go into another church show. <laughs> and that is your TED Talk tomorrow. No. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's all underhanded pitches. Right. Because it's like, come on, guys. This stuff's reality. It's just a joke like not but that. And that's one of the problems that, you know, you, you have in a lot of churches. It's like uh, the degree of reality is not addressed. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, what do okay. Oh no 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 we can't we can't talk about that here so no. right and, and then they'll go home and do the exact thing we can't talk exactly. about anyway that'll be the I, one thing they remember from you <laughs> <laughs> but anyway I know what it's like I mean it's part of the the business of of comedy in order to get better those things happen and That's and right. you, you learn from it you you, yep. you actually it makes you a better comedian when you it experience it um 
Angela, this has been a great convo. I, I appreciate you being on the show. This has been awesome. Um, Thank you for having me. How can fans follow you on social media or hire you for booking? You can you can go to AngelaHoover.com. You can get in touch with me that way. You okay. can um, you can follow me on Instagram. There's a lot of celebrity impressions there, and that's Angela Hoover Comedy. And um, yeah, and you can check out my my Patreon page if you want. If you are looking to learn how to do impressions, or um, I ha actually have a thing on there called Creative Cliff Notes, and it's this series of how to start. A creative endeavor from scratch even with all the negativity in your head like if you're just finding like you're just not doing it and you're finding reasons not to you're scared whatever um <laughs> yeah. called, you know it's called creative cliff notes and it talks about what i do and what i've done that has helped me and um because i feel like whenever you go to seminars they're just like yay go do it and then they don't talk about a week later where you're like you know what i don't want to because I'm just not interested anymore, you know. So we kind of yeah. go over that. But that's it. That's at patreoncom slash okay. Angela Hoover. They can check that out if you want to okay. become a patron. Awesome stuff, Angela. Yep. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna have a new project in November. I'm gonna like to so taking this to another level. I may give you another call. I'm gonna have a show where I'm actually doing a monologue and having comics come on and do sets you know, and, and just kind of have a, a, a sit down conversation and just just try to make this a, a little bit more than than conversations, because I think there's a lot of fun that can be had and during you know on this platform as we're waiting to get back to normal. Are you about ready to get back out there? As soon as people stop sending their kids to school with COVID. Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> I. Uh, yeah. 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 Bless their hearts. I. I mean, yes and no. I'm, I, I, if, if everything were okay and it was safe, it was really safe to go out. Would I love yeah. to have my kids go back to school? Yeah. Yesterday, I would. Yesterday yeah. and the day before, I would love to have them at school. But right now, I just don't feel like, with the numbers we're seeing and looking at Europe and what's happening with them putting their kids into school and getting more cases because of it, I, I don't feel completely confident that, um, for me that putting them in school setting is the best right now, but I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, we're looking at next year, but yes, I, I am ready, but this hasn't also totally been terrible for me. I I've kind of enjoyed just the slower pace of things. Yeah. I, Something I kind of nice. I think we'll all look back on. I know it's tough financially for all of us. And I, I, um, th that's, that's, you know, the truth, but, um, uh, it's just a rare time that we, put ourselves on pause like this. So kind of I don't, enjoy it I, while it's here. <laughs> well, I think you're hundred percent correct. And let's enjoy it while it's here. I don't know how they're playing football right now. I love football. I love it. And I'm going to watch it while it's on, but I got to honestly tell you, I don't know how in the world you can go out there and sweat, sweat on each other, bleed and spit and roll around on top of each other and then go to the bench and put a mask on. I don't, that doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you know, they all have to be tested, right? I mean, they have to be. Well, they are. They're they're tested like but, three you know, two four days times, later, but... you can have it. I don't know. I mean, but that is hilarious. You should you should do a bit about all these great safety practices in place and go through all the different things. I mean, it's hilarious. Take a seat, put a mask on. <laughs> I don't get it. What are they doing? You know, well, I just saw this big picture of somebody. They had like a college reunion or something on Instagram, and tons of people in the house. And it was like, we've all been tested. It's like, mm, you know, have you? You sure? Really? You sure? You all? And then you got all these. Hey, hey, Angela. And then you got all these false positives and false negatives coming back. I'm like, you oh, know, yeah. we don't. We don't know what we're doing. We, we just need know, to, everybody really. just needs to just kind of chill out for yeah. a minute. You'll be okay. You'll live. You could go a couple of months until we figure this thing out. And that's I all know. it comes down to. It's, but we don't want to stop. I know. It's, 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 it's really, it is tough. But the reality, reality is we move too quick. Then we, like, like they said in the beginning, they said you send people back too fast, you're going to get more cases. And that, that's exactly what happened. So. 
I, and I then wish we have the second was. wave coming up on top of all of that. You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, do we really know what the heck we're doing here? I I, I don't know. I'm I'm staying inside, Angela. I know. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, stay healthy, <laughs> please. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking with Angela Hoover. Check her out on Amazon Prime. She's a part of the show, Fake News, a Trump story. A film. Uh, yes. And 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 on those other shows that I mentioned that you were part of, Lucifer, uh, just roll with it. Um, and those uh, shows are are they still running, or do you have a They're recurring role? I did. I was um I was recurring on Walk the Pranks. So they had me come in and play different parts to prank okay. people, and then like Insecure and Lucifer. Those are all just you know those were all guest star roles. So I'm not part of the the permanent cast on those, but I am open. Okay, awesome stuff. Everybody, Angela Hoover on the Maurice Brown Show. Angela, thanks for being on, and God bless you. Thanks, Maurice. You too. Thanks a lot. Take care.